Astronomy Cast, episode 290 for Monday, January 21st, 2013, Failed Stars. Welcome to Astronomy Cast, our weekly facts based journey through the cosmos where we help you understand not only what we know, but how we know what we know. My name is Fraser Kane. I'm the publisher of Universe Today, and with me is Dr. Pamela Gay, a professor at Southern Illinois University, Edwardsville, and the director of CosmoQuest. Hey, Pamela, how are you doing? I'm doing well. How are you doing, Fraser? Good. Did you notice I added that director of CosmoQuest? I did. Yeah, That's very finally. exciting. Well, we've been doing CosmoQuest for so long, and we keep forgetting to include it in all the things that we do. So, for right. anyone who's never heard of CosmoQuest, what is it? It is a online research facility designed for the public. So we work to bring anyone out there who's interested in becoming part of solar system and space exploration an opportunity to engage in the same ways that scientists do. We have citizen science activities, we have weekly seminars, uh, we have a whole range of different ways including forums. We, we wove in the Bad Astronomy University Today forums into CosmoQuest. We have a whole variety of ways for you to get involved and I hope you'll take the time to check it out at CosmoQuest.org. Yeah, you can you can classify uh, craters on the moon, search for icy objects in the solar system. You know, really, our goal is to try and help regular folk uh, combine with scientists to do real science, and uh, and this is where we're this is what we're doing. So, and and we're succeeding. We we have absolutely our, yeah yeah we we discovered papers and yeah yeah no it's awesome okay great all right so let's get on to today's episode then one so announcement. We get another announcement? I have one quick announcement. Okay. So sorry. Um, so so we are in the process of phasing out the Astro Gear store because while we love all of you, you don't buy a lot of things. And um, as, as we're working to, to change out our staff, um, one, our wonderful Joe Ray has gone on to wonderful and better things than us. We're very sad, but we're proud of him. Um, and he was the person running our store. So we will continue to offer t-shirts into the future, but everything else we have is on closeout. So if you want to buy things, now is when you should buy things. So that's astrogear.com. All right. Buy things. Buy, buy things. things. All right. Well, I'm going to give – now Now can we start the show? Yes, now we can okay. start the show. All right. <clears throat> so if you get enough hydrogen together in one place, gravity pulls it together to the point that the temperature and pressures are enough for fusion to occur. This is a star. But what happens when you don't have quite enough hydrogen? Then you get a failed star, like a gas giant planet or a brown dwarf. So today we're going to talk about failed stars. Wah, wah. But so actually, sad. I think, but it, you know, failed stars are actually like super common. So maybe more common than regular stars? There's a lot um, of them out there. Yeah, I don't think we have enough statistics yet. That's yeah. the crazy thing is we've only been finding these things since the, the 80s, really. And and it's it's only been with the two-mass survey and a few others that we've really started to be able to find them in a meaningful way. And we're only finding them by the hundreds, but we find red dwarfs by the bazillions, basically. Yeah. Okay, so let's, um, so let's talk about sort of the, just the process of what it takes to make a star, and that will sort of help us understand why things fail. Right. So, so as we have entire shows on this, go back and listen to one of the shows on this, but it, in short, what happens is you have a giant molecular cloud of gas and dust, and all of this material, as the cloud gets shocked by something or gravitationally compressed by something, all of this gas begins to collapse in fragments, and the individual fragments will begin spinning. Uh, sometimes they'll split into mul multiple pieces. This is where binary stars come from, and some of those pieces just aren't quite big enough to fuse hydrogen and that's where we end up with failed stars. Now where things get messy is well then where do baby planets come from? So in this case you have a, a fragmenting spinning chunko molecular cloud and in its core you end up with a star forming and around that star will be a disk of material and that disk fragments into pieces that are orbiting around the primary star. Now then, when you have binary stars, you end up with two collapsing spinning bits, and the non-disky bit, that's, that's the star, and you can actually end up with disks around both of those fragments that are forming the binary star. So this can all get very complicated, but 
key component here is planets form in a disk of material through an, uh, an accretion process, whereas stars form via the fragmentation of molecular clouds and the collapse of those fragments into things that hopefully burn hydrogen. Right. And so, <clears throat> really, you know, we define that star as that ability. Enough mass has come together, enough is going on, that you've got that fusion and the star ignites. And our sun, obviously, is one of these, these stars, but they get a lot smaller, right? To still they do. Have, yeah. So how, how, small, how, how small can you get when you still have stars? You still, you know, you still get a success ribbon. The cutoff is near as we can tell, and we haven't actually found the po smallest possible star that you can have yet. Uh, as near as we can tell from theory is between 80 and 85 times the mass of Jupiter. So at a certain point, you stop using the Sun as your unit of comparison, and you start using Jupiter. So take Jupiter, multiply by somewhere between 80 and 85, and hydrogen will start fusing. But if you were going to go the other way and look at, say, the Sun, what percentage of the sun would it be? Like around 10%? You're asking me a number I did not calculate ahead of time. All right, that's the, it's 15%, <laughs> I think. <laughs> Sorry, this is where you all get to see the, the sausage yes. being made, and sausage we go, cake. Preston, please, please correct this. Um, I'm pretty sure it's 15. Yeah, but, but since I already said 80 Jupiter masses. Yeah, let's by see. all means, get the, get the right number. Right, I don't want to have to calculate this, so I'm going to see if Google actually knows it. It does. It's it, that's awesome. It's uh, seven and a half percent. Oh, seven and a half percent. Okay, great. Yeah. Okay. So. So I asked you a question on, as a as it relates to the sun. Right. So so compared to the sun, the, these are tiny objects. These are about seven and a half to eight percent the mass of the sun. So tiny, tiny, tiny stars. And I always find the process of these these red dwarf stars really fascinating because they're, you know, they have no radiative zone, right? It's all convective zone, and the whole thing is just churning its material. Right. And they actually last a really long time. And and they so this is the, the red dwarfs going. that we're, yeah, so these are red dwarfs yeah. that we're talking about. They're fully convective. So just like with your lava lamp, you see the blobs going to the surface and then going all the way back down to the bottom. In red dwarfs, you have the same process going on where there's nuclear fusion going on in the core, but then the hot material rises up to the surface, fully circulating. So when yeah. a red dwarf finally finishes the hydrogen process, it's pretty much used up everything that can be used up in the star. But it'll last, you know, those small ones, they're going to last trillions of years. Yeah, the, these are the longest lived things in our solar system. Not solar system. These are the longest lived things in our <coughs> galaxy. These are the longest yeah, lived totally. things in our galaxy. So, okay, so, so that's sort of where we set our limits. And so anything above 7.5% of the sun, you've got star, and there's really no, I guess, 100 times the mass of the sun. You know, that's a big, a big range. <clears throat> so, but obviously, you know, you're, you're going to end up with clumps of hydrogen coming together at smaller amounts than this 7.5% the, the of the sun. So what do we call these? Those, those are where you start to get into the brown dwarf stars. The, these are objects that... Well, it, we define them not just by how they form, but also by how they sort of, kind of, but then not very successfully for very long, do have a fusion process in their core. So with brown dwarf stars, the, these are objects these are objects that are 13 to, well, 80 to 85 times the mass of Jupiter. And at that cutoff, they're able to very briefly burn tritium and deuterium in their cores. These are heavy forms of hydrogen that have extra neutrons in their centers. Where do those come from, that, that extra hydrogen, the, the heavy forms of hydrogen? The, it's just one of the components of the universe. You look around the universe, you're going to find heavy hydrogen. Oh, um, I see. And so there's like a certain percentage of just a blob of hydrogen that's going to have yeah, those, exactly. those heavy elements in it. Okay. So just like water, there's heavy water, and we find heavy water in the ocean. It's just part of our ocean where some of the H2O formed with a deuterium atom in it instead of just straight old hydrogen. And so does this stuff like fall inside the, the star and clump together, or is it just a, a percentage of it that's able, it's able to use? It's just a percentage of it that it's easy, that it's easy for it to use is the key. Right. Uh, hydrogen doesn't burn 
when it's missing those extra neutrons nearly as easily as the, the heavier forms with the extra neutrons in it. So physics simply lets these stars more readily burn and then doesn't allow it to burn hydrogen that is missing these extra neutrons. And unfortunately, the heavier forms of hydrogen are much more rare. And so, because it's rare, I mean, it's only a small percentage of the, of the overall object that's made up from this stuff. So, so how much energy, how much heat, how much, how much can it do? Well, it, at the end of the day, it, it's able to burn only for a few hundred million years. And so you have this fully convective little star that, depending on just how big it is, um, in some cases, they can actually burn some lithium as well, because lithium burns very easily. Uh, but... It's it's only for a few hundred million years, and once they're done, they're done. And and how hot do they get? <laughs> That's the really kind of awesome thing is these things are are uh, during their their normal observed state. Uh, in some cases, basically human body temperature on their surface. Um, really? Yeah. So so we're looking at stars that in general are under a thousand degrees Kelvin. Right, but but way hotter. It, the, the deeper in you go. I mean, right. even Jupiter it, it, is hotter, right? Right, right. No, totally true. But but the fact that on their surface, yeah. uh, they, they get to be human temperature. And, and trying to figure out what to do to these forced us to expand the way we look at stars. We, we normally have the O's are the hottest, B, A, F, G. Uh, so we're, we're one of those normal G-type stars. Um, K, M, M are red dwarfs. Well, as, as we started adding new types, they, they had to add an L class, which are stars that start to have um, hydride bands in them. They start to have um, alkali metal bands in them. They then had to go on to add T class stars. These are stars where we actually start to see carbon monoxide in the atmospheres of the stars. And it goes all the way out to there's a handful of what we call Y type stars. And these are stars where we start seeing things like absorption lines from ammonia. And this actually made a much more polite and disturbing uh, mnemonic for how we think of all of this because oh, we're be used to the. Girl, Girl kiss, kiss Me yeah. is the normal one that we're used to. Now, we've added an L and a T and a Y, so it's become, oh, be a fine guy, kiss me later. Thank you. <laughs> right. Uh, so then is there a, I mean, is there this distinction between these brown dwarfs that are actively consuming and burning this, you know, these heavier forms of hydrogen and the ones that have run out of fuel? Do astronomers make some kind of distinction between them? No, and, and I honestly don't know if we've observed any way that we can specifically say this one is currently undergoing nuclear reactions. The, these are extremely rare objects in our current observational data sets. We, I, I can't tell you how rare or not rare they are in the sky, uh, but because we're only starting to absor observe them, um, we, we only have so many data points and they burn for such a short period of time that trying to catch one in our few hundred observations is actively burning. I don't know if statistically we can say we should have done that with certainty yet. But is it one of those situations where it <clears throat> gets to its temperature and then it just takes a really long time to cool down? I mean, I know that, you know, we talk about, like, uh, stars that turn into white dwarves and then the white dwarves will eventually turn into black dwarves, but that process is going to take billions and trillions of years for these stars to reach the, the background temperature of the universe. And so, in theory, at, these at the end of wars, the day, these, these, these just don't get that hot. They, they no. just don't get that hot. But they're still cooling down over long periods of time. They, they are, but it's, it's not the same way you think of, of white dwarfs cooling off. Um, with a white dwarf, you're starting off with something that's tens of thousands of degrees Kelvin. And, and so when they cool off to a few hundred degrees Kelvin and become what we call black dwarfs, that's a massive change. These guys start off around a thousand degrees Kelvin and cool off to a few hundred degrees Kelvin. <laughs> and so when you're looking at something like that, it's a very different situation. And, and these, these are, are just, they're stars that don't work in the ways that we think of. The smallest of them, just like Jupiter, are, are supported through normal gas pressure. But the largest of them are supported just like white dwarfs through electron degeneracy pressure. So here you have something extremely small. Um, 
fairly dense, but not white dwarf dense. All of them were, are within 10 to 15% of the same radius. So take Jupiter and you add stuff to Jupiter and it doesn't get bigger. Yeah. It just gets denser. Uh, keep adding stuff and it changes how it supports itself from gas pressure to electron degeneracy pressure. Their, their temperature doesn't vary that much across the entire range. The, these things just don't behave in the way that we're nor normally used to thinking of stars because they aren't normal stars. They're this yep. weird transition object. Um, okay, so so I guess my, my next question then is, uh, sorry, I just got a note from the kids. <laughs> <laughs> um, so my, no, no, my, my son's sick, and so he's, yeah, just give me an update. Um, sorry, focus? All right, next question. This, sorry, Preston, this is going to be the worst episode ever for, for hacking it in. Um, right, so I guess the question that I wanted to ask next then is, is what is the method that astronomers use to find these objects? Because they're not bright. They're not shining in the night sky. How do they find them? Infrared. And, and it's, it's not just that they're not bright. It's that they're not bright and they're not really giving off light in useful wavelengths. Um, it, it's perfectly possible to detect a very, very faint blue object, red object, um, with normal telescope. No big deal. They're faint. They're annoying. We can do it. Now, now brown dwarfs pose an entirely new challenge because they're so extraordinarily red that the bulk of their light is given off in wavelengths that aren't readily observed with your normal optical telescope. So you have to get above the Earth's atmosphere and you have to start using things like the WISE telescope. That's one of the instruments that's been used. They are found ground-based. Sloan Digital Sky Survey's done a lot of work finding them. Um, but the easiest way to find them is to start looking in the IR. The other problem that you run into in trying to find these suckers is they like to cuddle up next to nice bright stars. And so now you have to start doing things like using what are called coronagraphs, which is where you uh, essentially put a, a disk in front of your stellar disk on the sky, block out its light, and then look to see if there's anything faint near that bright star. So it gets kind of tedious to have to use a chronograph to look at every bright star in the sky to try and find brown dwarfs that are in binary systems, the isolated ones that are easier to find. Right. So the point being that if you know, you're going to get a situation where the star is in a binary companion with a brighter star, this gives you a way to to know where to look because they're right. so hard they're so hard to see and I know that people also are looking for them just in these stellar nurseries right they're looking for places where brighter stars are likely to be right you might so find... so we look for them all the places we look for normal stars but they're annoying to find you really have to be looking in the IR and the near IR yeah now you know we've got the James Webb Space Telescope coming out in the next five years. Um, are, will that be able to help join the search for, for brown dwarfs? I, I think that that would be a, a strange use of such a powerful telescope to use it to survey for new brown dwarfs. But what it can do, and what I expect it will be doing, is imaging not just brown dwarfs, but also giant Jupiters. Uh, we're, we're now at the point that we're starting to be able to individually look at some extrasolar planets. Spitzer's done this in a few cases and they, they've also looked at a few brown dwarfs this way and do individualized meaningful studies of things that are already discovered. Uh, it, it really takes a whole family of different types of telescopes to first survey the sky and catalog what's there and then follow up in detail and understand what those objects really are. Right, and so it might not be the, the tool for surveying, but it's right. definitely going to be the tool for doing follow-up observations. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's going to be an enormous telescope. Hubble is like 1.6 meters, and this is 6.5 meter telescope. It's just right. It's enormous. Um, Right, but that makes sense. You might be a waste of its of its time to be surveying for them. Right. Uh, so now you actually sort of led into this, right? We've got this situation. We've got these these brown dwarfs, the the high end of the of the failed star, but it's really a, a spectrum. I mean, wherever you get hydrogen clumping together, all the way down to nothing, <laughs> you know, you're going to have this. You're going to have some situation. So so let's go the other way, and as we get smaller and smaller and smaller less mass, I guess smaller is not a good way to put it, right? Because as you said, they, they kind of stay the same size. They just right. get more 
more dense. So how does how does that work on the on the lower end? Well, on the lower end, this this is where things start to get messy, uh, and people start to argue because we can't basically stick a probe inside of one of these extrasolar planets or brown dwarfs and try and figure out well, did it ever do any burning? So so what we start doing is looking, is there lithium in the atmosphere? If there's lithium in the atmosphere, it means it didn't burn lithium. So that at least puts one level of constraint on the system. Okay. And, and as we go down, people just start arguing. Uh, so we know that below 10 masses, not a planet. Uh, we're pretty sure above 13 masses is a failed star, did have some sort of temporary nuclear burning. In that middle range, you have these weird objects snuggled up against stars that we call brown dwarfs, but they're at the 10 Jupiter mass level. And it's thought that there is either some sort of mass loss or something else happened. And, and so it's unclear what to call some of these objects. Are they failed stars? Are they bloated planets? And, and that's one where I think a lot of work on the definition still needs to happen and we need better models. And I mean, part of it is like, is it orbiting a star? But I guess that's the distinction. But binaries. Like, yeah, binaries. is it a binary companion or is it a planet going around a star? And, and if we didn't watch it form and, and we don't see a protoplanetary disk that it's part of, we, we have no way of knowing did, did this object that we're looking at form via an accretion process like a planet or through a collapse process like a star. And now you mentioned sort of earlier on that that things like Jupiter, for example, if you added mass to Jupiter, you added, you know, you collided two Jupiters together, you wouldn't necessarily get a much larger object, right? No, you'd get an object the exact same size, more or less, within a few percent. That's one of the kind of awesome things. Uh, it, it's one of those cases where the density just keeps going up, and the way the pressure and gravity balance, the radius stays very similar as you go from roughly Jupiter sized all the way up to one of these well 80 Jupiter mass not quite yet a star objects. Wow. Yeah. It, yeah. It's really kind of awesome. It's, it's, it's physics just balances out this way. Now if you could look at one like a brown dwarf what would you see? you'd see a magenta object that has convective cells on the surface. So when, when you look at the sun through a really good hydrogen alpha filter and you magnify it sufficiently, you can see these boiling cells yeah. on its surface. Well, you actually have convective cells driving brown dwarfs as well. And, and brown is really a, a misnomer. The brown isn't something you get through additive light processes generally. Um, rather, they're this deep, deep magenta. I hate to say this, but they're basically the color my hair currently is. Um, but yeah, they're magenta objects, and brown is just much easier to say and spell. So, sort of a reddy, yeah, reddy color, but with big, yeah. so like on the spectrum of a red dwarf, but deeper red, darker red. Um, so, red dwarfs are much more Crayola in color. This is where you start to get to that deep maroon, um, the, the MIT blood on concrete is the joke they use, that, that deep maroonish, right. ruddy color. But I mean, if you look at Jupiter, right, you see it's got these bands and these storms on, on its surface, and yet when you reach the brown dwarf size, you've got convective sends, cells you know, blobbing up like a, like a lava lamp. So, so where does that happen? Um, Where do you go from one to the other? <laughs> it, it's all going to depend. Here, we only have one example with Jupiter, yeah. so it's, it's hard to say. So with Jupiter, what we're seeing is, is these different cells where um, we, we did an entire episode on, on the weather of these planets before where you end up with different atmospheric levels on Jupiter rotating the planet at different rates. This leads to bands of various colors going um, at different rates around the planet, which causes some to appear to move back relative to others and you don't see the active convection. Now we can't actually image the detailed surface of a brown dwarf so uh, we're basing everything we know about what they would look like off of models. So based on what we know from models you should end up with, with 
convective cells that, that are visible on the largest of these, but as you get to smaller and smaller ones, as, as you start to go from the later to the thank you part of our, our mnemonic out to the Y spectral class stars, um, now perhaps you're going to start getting that banding similar to what we see at Jupiter, but until we have observations. I can't tell you exactly when these transitions take place, exactly when the convective cells start to get hidden by, um, well, weather patterns in the atmosphere of these failed stars. Yeah, I mean, I know that there were some observations of some extrasolar planets where they were able to see, like, they were tidally locked to their star, and, and yet the... Well, they don't see that they're tidally locked. No, they... but they, but they, no, they calculate that they're tidally yes. locked, and yet the heat was being distributed across the entire planet, and so there had to be ferocious storms that were, right. that were transmitting, so that would, you would see these bands of these storms as they were swirling around the planet. Um, but, you know, if you got bigger and bigger, eventually just the, that convective process would, would take over but there's no sort of clear line on where that happens yet it's really interesting. and and this is where we need things we need orbital interferometry basically we we need the ultra high resolution imaging capabilities from space where we can be above the atmosphere and hopefully sometime in our lifetime the money will be invested into science to make this possible but until then we have models in our computers and the models are at least getting better slowly. Now, I think there was a great uh, sort of misnomer that flew around the internet a couple of years ago, and we've covered it a couple of times in Astronomy Cast. This idea that when the Galileo spacecraft, the nuclear-powered Galileo spacecraft, was crashed into the uh, into Jupiter, that it was going to ignite Jupiter and turn it into a second star. No, and, and that, <laughs> based on the conversation we've just had, that concept was deeply flawed. Deeply, deeply flawed. Right. Uh, yeah, no. Jupiter is is it, that that's like saying that that me squishing a mosquito onto my skin is somehow going to cause me to go thermonuclear. Uh, no, it's not. Even if it is a radioactive mosquito that's going to give me superpowers. Uh, it, yes, Galileo was carrying nuclear fuel on it. Um, but that just means that it was giving off a lot of heat as those radioisotopes uh, did their normal half-life thing and decayed and gave off energy and powered the mission. It's not like it was a nuclear bomb or had the capacity to become one. And even if it was, it wouldn't matter. Right. We could blow nuclear bombs up in the atmosphere of Jupiter and it would disrupt the weather patterns for a while. But not that long. We've we've dropped comets on. Well, we haven't personally. We did that. The yeah. solar system <laughs> has dropped. <laughs> the solar system has dropped uh, comets into the atmosphere of Jupiter, giving off the energy equivalent of nuclear weapons. Yeah. And in in the process, Jupiter took it on the chin and healed up rather quickly. Yeah. And so the only way that that Galileo could do that is if it happened to have. 79 times the mass of Jupiter somehow uh, Yeah, and even then it's questionable. To guarantee it, you need at least like 83 times, 83, 84 okay. times. Yeah, 84 times the mass of Jupiter packed into that little <laughs> spacecraft, and then it smashes in and boom. And, and it has to be hydrogen too, so. And, and, and maybe if it was that weird red stuff that was theorized in, right. in the recent in Star, Star Trek, yeah. which doesn't work. Yeah, all right, cool. <laughs> awesome, okay, well, thank you very much, Pamela. Thank you very much. And Preston, we're sorry. One last apology to the editor. He, he needs a challenge every now and then. <laughs> He's a grad student. He's already challenged. Oh, okay. All right. Um, save, save, save. Um, and I hope we amused all of you out there getting to watch us do this live. Yeah, this is the part where we regret that decision. Yes. Why did we think that was a good idea? No, no, no. Why did you think that was a good idea? I'm just along for the ride on this whole doing things live in front of an audience. Oh, so it's my fault. Yes. Right. Okay. <laughs> um, awesome. All right. Okay. So, a bunch of questions. Uh, well, this is a good one. So L A A L S F A F C asks, what happens to a black dwarf after it has radiated all its energy? What happens to the electron degenerate matter? Does it disintegrate from entropy? No, it just sits there going, I'm cold. Now a black dwarf, right, is a 
is a cooldown oh, white dwarf, and a white dwarf aren't they maybe like carbon lattice diamond structures? The the outer level probably has a lattice structure that resembles the lattice structure of a diamond, um, but but to say they exactly are a diamond is is kind of like saying that Barbie wears real high heels. Yes, they're similar, but they're not identical. Right, but the point being that 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 object through gravity and just you know the material that it's made of is going to hang together. It's not going to. Yeah, gravity holds it all together, and gravity doesn't care what temperature it is, or or whether the electrons are floating around or been mashed together into this electron degenerate form. Right. It's gravity's holding it tight. Okay. Um, <clears throat> from Augusto. Gusto Liquid on YouTube asks, um, <clears throat> do the gas giants form before the rocky planets or all of them formed at the same time? Is there a way to determine what planet formed first? They're all formed at the same time, but they form at different rates. Um, exactly how that happens? Well, the, one of the problems we're running into is we thought we knew how solar systems formed, and then we started finding hot Jupiters, and now we know we don't know how solar systems were formed. Uh, so uh, I can't answer that. We just right. don't know. There's no satisfying right. model for planetary formation right now. Right, but I mean, you know, when we look at the, the 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 main method of determining the age of the solar system is to calculate the the age of the meteorites and see that all the meteorites came were all formed at roughly the same time. But that tells you essentially that the rocky objects were formed at the same time. It doesn't tell you about the gas objects. So right. Um, so Thomas uh, Tranaker asks, uh, what is the minimum mass before a star can produce a gamma ray burst at its end? Oh, uh, <clears throat> minimum, I want to say, is order of magnitude 10 solar masses. And that, I mean, that's where you get the, like those wolf ray stars, right? Yeah, go, yeah. <laughs> Type well, no, so Wolf Ray stars are 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 young stars. They they have to go through all of their burning processes. Um, gamma ray bursts come as as part of a hypernova, so that's the death of a star. So it starts as a Wolf Ray, yeah. goes through its normal life, finishes its normal life, and then goes kablooey. And and whether or not it goes boom as a supernova or a hypernova depends on things like uh, rotation rates and how much mass loss it incurred while it was a Wolf Ray star. Uh, so another question, I guess this is kind of the same question, but Andre Brovchenko asks, what is left after they cool down? Is there anything after black dwarfs? So, so if, you, if you're talking about white dwarfs, white dwarfs just cool down to black dwarfs. Now, now one of the reasons that I'm be being cautious with my language here is when people first started theorizing the existence of brown dwarfs, what we just finished recording an episode on uh, back in the 1960s, they were originally called black dwarfs. It was actually Jill Tarter, out at, who's now at the SETI Institute, who renamed them as brown dwarfs as we started thinking about things like the, the cooling of white dwarf stars. So white dwarfs go to black dwarfs, and white dwarfs are the end product of the life of a sun-type star. And brown dwarfs are what happens when you have something that's not big enough to fuse hydrogen. And they're purely theoretical because the amount of time it would take for them to cool down to the background temperature of the universe is still trillions and trillions of years away. Black so. dwarfs are fully theoretical, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So none, although there are white dwarfs, Well, and still we've, we've proved that they cool. Years. We, we can actually, by comparing the, the temperature of white dwarfs in a variety of different uh, star clusters, since it's star clusters, we know how old they are, we can actually check, and it has been verified that our cooling models are accurate. Hmm. Um, Guido Bibra notes that the guys proposing the, uh, the Jupiter ignition theory had simply read too much Arthur C. Clarke, which was, was that 2010? Which was the mm -hmm. one where they ignited Jupiter by... I think it was yeah. 2010. I think it was the second one. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, so he got the Europa right, which is that Europa's neat. And don't land there because there might be life, but he got the igniting Jupiter part wrong. Um, so Fernando Laca asks, I do not understand how a star is able to collect more gas after acquiring enough mass to turn on and starts... Sending out the stellar wind. 
Uh, it it it's just getting rid of the mass that it has. So like our our sun is is constantly giving off a stellar wind, um, but it's it's such a small amount that it doesn't noticeably perceptively change the total mass of the sun. So every time I inhale and exhale, not every breath is the same size, and I'm constantly giving off mass in the exhalation part of that. But if I'm standing on the scale, whether or not I've inhaled or exhaled is not going to be a measurable difference on the scale. Now over the life of the sun, it does actually affect models. And over the life of a wolf ray star, which has massive multiple solar masses um, at a time, stellar winds, um, then it starts to become an issue. But once that stellar wind kicks in, it blows away all the free hydrogen that's that's that didn't make it onto the star. Yes. And then, and that's that, right? There's yeah. no more mass coming in. Now there's just mass going out. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, let's see. Any more questions? Um, oh, here's a good one. Uh, so Artie Brewer 4 asks, which puts out heat longer, a white dwarf or a brown dwarf? Puts out heat longer or a white dwarf? Right, because it's just so, it starts out so much hotter. And and the total amount of energy it has to give off is that much greater. And you mentioned that a brown dwarf really only gets a few hundred million years of that of that heavy hydrogen burning before that process turns off, and then and then it's just cooling down, just yeah. like a like a white dwarf is. But and white it dwarf never is... really gets hot. It gets right. like science laboratory nuclear reaction hot, not center right. of the sun nuclear reaction hot. Yeah, yeah, and that's that takes a long time. And space is such a terrible place to radiate your heat away that it just takes trillions of years to cool down. Um, I think that's it. If anyone else has got a question, I'd be glad to throw it in there. Um, Uh, one more question then from L A L S S F A F C. Uh, is there a difference between the spectra of brown dwarfs and a super super Jupiter like planet? Yes. So will they have a different spectra? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we've actually observed that. So, I, I what what I was trying to explain at at the I guess beginning part of the episode is as we go through the L T and Y spectrum of of brown dwarfs, um, we see different types of characteristic molecular bands that distinguish each of the different types of brown dwarfs, where for the L class we're starting to see the hydride bands and the alkali metals. In the T stars uh, we're seeing H and K band, we're seeing methane, um, and then as we go into the Y band um, you're starting to see water and methane in these cases. So each of these different temperatures, you start to see different patterns in the spectrum. Cool. Um, let's see, I'm trying to understand the question. Okay, so so this comes from uh, Sylvan Vespi, I think. Um, how do you how are brown dwarfs distinguished from warm planimos at the moment? So does that, does that um, make sense? I don't know what a warm planimo is. Well, planimos, a hot Jupiter. Yeah, I think they're but in accretion disks, right? So, yeah, I don't know. So, so the the general way that you define planet versus brown dwarf is um, the brown dwarfs form through the molecular carb, the molecular cloud collapsing down into a spinning object that is the star. Whereas planets are formed when the clasping collapsing disk spirals down and the center of that is the star but then there's a flattened disk of material around it and over time that flattened disk accretes into a variety of individual objects that we call planets. Right, right. Um, unless it's Pluto and then it, you're not a planet. So not a planet, no. Not a planet. Or Ceres. Right. Ceres was also <laughs> not a planet. stripped. Awesome. Okay, well I think we're running out of time here so Thank you very much, Pamela. Now, you're thinking that we might sneak another recording in maybe this week? Might. No promises? Yeah. Okay. No promises. Yeah. We'll try. Yeah. We, we know we've got about four to catch up, so we'll, we'll get yeah. through. Awesome. Okay. All right. Well, thanks, everybody, for watching. Thank you so much, Pamela, for, for bringing the brain again, and uh, we will see you. What's coming up next, then, officially?
Uh, officially next is going to be Learning Space on Wednesday, followed by My Moon with the Lunar and Planetary Institute. So stay tuned at 6 p.m. Central, 7 p.m. Central for those two shows, and we will be getting events out. Fantastic. Okay, great. All right, we'll see you later, Pamela. Okay, see you. <laughs> Bye-bye.